Hey everyone, I'm Alex. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO here at Snorkel, also on faculty at University of Washington, and really excited to be talking today with DJ Patil, who's currently a general partner at Great Point Ventures and was formerly the first US chief data scientist. DJ, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. My pleasure. I'm so glad you're bringing this community together. Thank you. I want to start with a basic question. You were the, you know, first chief data scientist of the United States. That that sounds awesome to me, uh, but I'm sure myself and many others here don't have a lot of context in kind of the, the history of this position, the mission, the mandate. Tell us a little bit about kind of how that all started and kind of what you think was the, the most exciting accomplishment from, from starting up this, this position. Well, I think the first uh, thing that we need to, to acknowledge is actually the U.S. has actually had an incredible use of data for throughout its history. George Washington was really focused in how do you think about mapping? He was a cartographer in addition to all the other things that he did. You had the census hard written into the Constitution to make sure that we are collecting data. You have um, um, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and his efforts to really say, how do we think about our economy? There were, that, that was really the beginning of the data ecosystem, even though it's much more recent in time. And you, so you watch that arc, there actually has been a US chief statistician, and that role is a very important role, and it's kind of gotten burdened with so many other jobs. You have a National Economic Council and Council of Economic Advisors and who are doing a tons of lifting. And what President Obama saw happen during his campaigns, which I was not involved in, was really the use of data in very novel ways, predominantly for engagement of the community, to get people motivated, to get out and vote, all of those efforts. And as that took place, and he was going into into actual office, first thing he created was a US CTO, a chief technology officer for the United States and responsibility of how do we think about technology, all these things that are kind of coming together. The issue sets that we're talking about today are AI, the point person for those kind of things. That the first two chief technology officers, first was Anish Chopra, then Todd Park, their focus was actually about data, opening up data, how do we, release federal data so people can use it. Uh, weather data, um, census data, economic forecasts, there's so much data, healthcare data that's out there that can be utilized. And as a third CTO was taking office, uh, that's Megan Smith was a CTO, they realized that the previous CTO arc actually is a different thing than all the other things a CTO needs to do. And so there's a forever, it kind of almost was like it graduated. And so that was the realization that somebody has to carry on this mantle of ensuring the president, the presidency has access to the best data, uses data the way. It's kind of like the version of, if for the Star Trek fans, it's like, who's Spock on the bridge to help out on these problems? And that's the US, it's a combination of the, the kind of the chief scientist, the head of OSTP, Office of Science Technology Policy, the US CTO and the US chief data scientists. And they kind of have different interlocking roles. And it's just like the National Security Council has many different experts for different kinds of issues. And so that, that, that purview became turned into a mission statement. And that mission statement is to responsibly unleash the power of data to benefit all Americans. And super timely given all the conversations around AI because the first part of that statement is responsibly unleash the power of data and to benefit all Americans, not just some, but everyone collectively. And that was hard, that, that was a very deliberative process signed off by, by President Obama and that established the role. And so what problems do we pick? Like if you were to take this job, you're like, well, where, where do you start? You know, and so we came up with a framework, which is has to impact uh, more than $1 trillion of US spend. Um, impacts 50% uh, um, of the U.S. population or helps a population that has no recourse. So what are problems in that bucket? Healthcare, 20% of GDP. Costs, access to care. How do we enable precision medicine, the idea of tailored genomic treatments, cancer moonshot, those kind of efforts? And why would President Obama put the chief data scientist in charge of that 
rather than Francis Collins, who helped lead the decoding of the Human Genome Project. And it was a realization like, wait, we've been doing that for 20 plus years. The new play is get the data people in there, get them to help break open this problem in novel ways. But it also extended to criminal justice reforms. How do we think about body cameras? Who pays for the cameras? How do you think about privacy around the data? What happens if someone mucks with the, the, the image and footage? How do you make sure when victims are in the footage? Who has access first? What are the rights? All of those things come under the purview here, as well as continuing to open up all the data that you see on data.gov. That's that's super fascinating. I hadn't even thought about uh, what it must have been like to kind of show up and have you know all of the problems uh, that you could potentially uh, approach and have that burden. No, no problem. Like by, when you're at the White House, the good problems have all been taken. <laughs> They've been solved by somebody else. The, the, the stuff that is really, really hard or doesn't have good answers, that's what makes its way to the to the White House and definitely makes it to, you know, once one, two steps outside the Oval Office where you're trying to solve these things. Just focusing on on the, the term data science and the term data scientist, you know, as it's different from, say, chief statistician, I mean, what do you think is powerful about that that term, how does it accentuate what you think needs to be done differently under a data science mandate versus a domain expert, like uh, you mentioned, um, or a statistician uh, or an economist? Yeah, it's, it's a super great point because, you know, the origin story, there's been many origin stories of data scientists, in fact. And, you know, many, what I would argue is many of the people who've been doing data science for a long time have gotten forgotten. You know, think the Mayans, think people in the Indus Valley, think about the women in Bletchley Park, solve, saving us during World War II. They were, they were, they are all data scientists. They're using data in very complex environments. They didn't have cloud compute and all these other things, but they are data scientists. The version that's more, the modern version, I think, is really what we saw happening at Facebook and LinkedIn at that time was we were using data for the first time to be this front-facing product for a, a, for a, the consumer. It was like things like, they may seem trivial now, but people you may know who viewed my profile, job recommenders. And the technology to support these things didn't really exist. We were just starting to see open source databases, still was really a, the only game in town primarily was Oracle. So it was very early days, the notion of a data warehouse democratizing was different. And when we looked at the titles for the teams, research scientists was kind of the predominant one that was put forward by Yahoo. And they're doing some of the most early work around Hadoop and all these things. And that showed to teams a lot of times that the, the research scientist was doing something more academic and they never get pulled into the product team. And then insight that, that I think we had at LinkedIn between Reid Hoffman and myself was like data can't be just some back office team, can't be beholden to product. It is a front office team. It is, owns its own profit and loss PL. It is responsible for engagement. It has designers, it has engineers, it has everything. And it lives and dies based on its ability to execute on the company's mission. And that was very different from almost every other place. As Jeff was setting up his team at Facebook and I was doing a LinkedIn, we shared a lot between our teams, what was happening with um, the, the, the Yahoo team, the Google team, and no one had great names for ourselves. You know, Hal Varian was talking about statisticians. We were like, well, we're recruiting all these different kind of people, maybe a little more physicists like hedge funds were. And so Monica had this great idea when we kind of for playing around with the list, Monica Rigatti, she she's like, well, why don't we test every job title on LinkedIn? Because we have all the posts. Like, and let's see what people apply to. <laughs> Everyone applied to the data scientist one. And, and the reason I think it, 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 was, it was like, by the way, we were thinking more analytic scientists at that time was the title. But yeah. but because we're but we were really struggling with this. And what we realized, I think, which has been surprising is why is the term taken off? And it's because it is actually ambiguous. People don't really know what it means. And so that, that prevents you from being put in a box. If yeah. you're the research scientist, they're like, this problem is too practical. Go away. Yeah. If you're the PI yeah. person, well, you can't do more than just building dashboards and looking up you know, SQL queries. 
the data scientist is like nerd. (laughs) (laughs) And you're like, great, you have purview. And that purview gives you context. And when you have context, you can now bring your technical skills to bear to have an impact. And what's interesting in the role of the chief data scientist, that team of us, and this is really, I think the important point is data science is a team sport. It's never just one kind of individual from a skill set perspective, but our team was able to go to the economists, the statisticians, the scientists at NIH, the people at NASA, and we were kind of the glue between this. And this is why I think the data science major has taken off. It is the one horizontal that is interdisciplinary that supports the whole aspect of a university. You have license to go and pull any multiple departments together. And that is the same way we're seeing with AI and all these other things. This is an interdisciplinary world. And I I wrote a blog post about this recently about the focus of what we should be thinking about are what I'm calling MIPS, these massive multi-interdisciplinary problems. That is what's gonna change the game for our country and and the broader landscape for everything that we're we see. That's awesome. I mean, just just to riff on that for a second. I mean, uh, my my experience is uh, much more, much much narrower, right? But I love that that um, that aspect of maybe I'll pull on two things there, kind of the, the interdisciplinary aspect, and then also the kind of ambiguity and the flexibility that that affords. I, I like I like those as two points to pull out. Um, you know, the interdisciplinary nature. You know that's something I know we we we've seen a lot in in what we've done. Um, you know, going back to I think the, the first DARPA project that we worked at under uh, uh, at back at Stanford with the early uh, open source research uh, snorkel project was uh, DARPA Simplex, and it was a wonderful one. I'm I'm <laughs> sure you're very familiar. Um, you know, it was a wonderful one because it it paired. Uh, you know, a data science or ML AI team with a, a subject matter expert, a SME team, and that pairing, I, I, I've you know believed ever since. A little biased from that first experience, it was one of the most fundamental, um, you know, signify you know determinants of success with with you know data science or, or with AI ML is do you are, is it interdisciplinary, right? Do do you have some subject matter expertise? I think this, there may have been like a it was the more data driven. I went there's some something I went to once and they have this uh, example of like pie shaped versus T shaped expertise. Like if you want to be a good data scientist, you need you know, the core data science tenets, you need depth there, you need depth in one, you know, subject merit matter area in you or your team, and then you have the horizontal skills. So I think interdisciplinarity is just so critical for what data scientists need to achieve things, but also what they can achieve. And I love your point about kind of the ambiguity of the title lets you kind of get the context you need. And I mean, some of the, you know, we, we try to build, you know, we build a data centric platform for data scientists. And one of the things we see that the most successful teams do is they just kind of um, do it. They're anchored on a real kind of front-facing business or front-facing objective uh, rather than to a specific role, right? So they'll, they have the freedom to do whatever they want. Problem they focused need. rather yeah, than exactly, yeah. people focused yeah, or who's the authority person focused. Yeah. If I need to do some research, I'll do it to get this done. If I need to do some statistics, right. like, but just, yeah, it's just problem oriented. And yeah. I love that point that like, the phrase data scientist gives you enough freedom to move and to be anchored on the problem. I would tell everybody out there, one of the things of trying to restrict data scientists versus to other terms or AI person, like we're getting hung up on our own egos of what we call ourselves. The world doesn't care. The world yeah. cares if we solve a problem. Yes. And, and as we head into AI, and I, I, I suspect this is reflected in your own you know, academic endeavors as well. It's like you look at where the interesting money is going. And this is definitely true how not only U.S. federal dollars are going from a budgetary aspect for, for research. China's going this way. Europe's going. Everyone's going this way. It doesn't look like a university. Chemistry building. Math. Physics. Yeah. Everything is like, well, how do we give, how do we understand the genome? Well, that requires a team. If you're going to try to figure out climate change, you're not just going to give it to energy people. Like you, you have to, we have to bring very broad teams. And so what I tell people, 
these days, if you're working in AI, you should not be thinking about it as, oh, I only do AI. Because look at the speed of things are changing. You, sh you should be thinking like at least as an E, not just a T. Like you should yeah. be brought across a bunch of things deep in at least two to three things, just given yeah. the speed of change that's happening around us. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think from, from an academic perspective, briefly, you know, everything that I've seen both in our team's work and in other parallel teams, it's been the most exciting, you know, at least within the applied area on the academic side is anchored on a problem or a set of problems first. And people are scared of doing this because they think, oh, it's going to be too applied rather than a fancy new method. But that's where all the new meaningful things get invented. And same thing with, with startups, again, and of one from the snorkel journey so far for myself. But, you know, my view is that you, you learn everything that's worth learning from just anchoring on, you know, early customer problems. You only make real progress when you anchor on a problem rather than on a role or a discipline, like you said. Can I share a quick story? Yeah, yeah, I love, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, there was a time when we were, when we were in office where there was all this question of AGI, the, the you know, the, ah, Skynet's going to happen and take over <laughs> the world and all of this. And so President Obama had kind of called us in and said, hey, because nerds, he wanted his nerds around, council of nerds. It was like, what's really the truth here? And we realized like, well, is this AGI thing real versus other stuff? And he said, go figure it out and go come back with an assessment. And so that began this question of really uh, specialized AI versus you know generalized AI kind of questions. And we came back with an assessment. And then President Obama said, you know, I think you guys are missing the point. And we're like, <laughs> you're a constitutional law professor. We, <laughs> we do data and AI. And this is Ed Felton. This is myself. This is like, this is, this is like, so we felt we knew what we we're doing. He said, you need to go back and look harder at this because this change is going to be much more massive than I think you you realize. And we were walking out going, what's it like, what, what does that mean? And why is the president of the United States, the person who's like spending all his job time thinking about how to just make sure the world works, kind of is calling us out on this. And so Ed really led this effort was like, what does this look like from an AI perspective? We came back and we realized, oh my gosh, there's all these other things, that first beginning of automation and all the transformations that were happening. And that led to the first ever report that we wrote as the national AI strategy. Of course, China looked at that and was like, that looks awesome. And they went and implemented it. And then we have been very slow as a country, unfortunately, to implement. But the, the part there that is the most important that I think is there is how does a president see this when the rest of us who are technical missed it? And, and that's the part that I focus on. And then what I think is the reason is because we were too much of a T. Yep. We were too deep. And what he's looking at, and he's like, here is how trade is about to transform across the globe. Here's how and he's seeing all these things. And he's like, look, this thing, this little thing that you guys are playing with is about to break loose and cause a cascade because the world is primed for it. And it's stunning to me that a constitutional law professor saw it before any of us saw it. That's a, that's an awesome anecdote. I mean, and yeah, I think it makes you know there, there's there's a there's a benefit from from hyper you know from specialization and there, it blinds you to some things. What do you think is well? And maybe I'll ask it in two parts. Like relative to that point when you did the assessment, what has been most surprising to you? You know, from a from a you know U.S. level standpoint about you know what's happened in the last couple of months in the yeah. last year or two with AI, and what do you think is even currently most kind of being under underappreciated about what's ahead for us? So here's a few thoughts. Here's what we got wrong in the report. You know, we were thinking like, hey, all these low paying jobs are going to get disrupted. The truck driver, the, the person working, flipping burgers, those kind of jobs that have often been 
um, a combination of very dangerous many times in manufacturing to to also just not having been great paying jobs, honestly. And what those are not the jobs that are being disrupted. It's the it's like the potential we see it with the large language models. Now we're like, whoa, what, how should we think about the lawyer? How should we think about some of these things? We also have seen that radiology, despite what everyone's been talking about for radiological images, we're not even close to disruption there because cultural momentum is a thing. It is really hard to change culture of an ecosystem of how stuff works. And, it, and we're talking like almost a decade now into this. Yeah. The other portion that I think is there is we realize that what we missed is dexterity. Like dexterity is hard. Knowledge worker and stupid, boring problem version of where a person just is filling out stuff, almost like the plus plus version of robotic process automation. That's where the disruption is likely to take place. The part that I think we've missed on, honestly, and I, I think um, the late Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, Reid Hoffman, Eric Schmidt, myself, a number of other uh, people have really called out on, has been, we are not investing enough. This is a Sputnik moment. And we were, wrote, uh, we collectively wrote a report for the Council of Foreign Relations about this. It's like, this is the moment of go. Like, we need to be think, treating this as a national effort to go all in on, like, what this is. And this raises this raises fundamental questions around ethics, support. How do we think about this? What are rights? But what we have right now is we know that other nation states are going all in. We know that this could be one of the most transformative time around. And we need to make sure that we do this, like, full speed to make sure that the systems and other thing technology we're building have the value sets that we believe are critical for the future we want our kids to grow up in. And we need to ensure, and it must be an and, that this technology works for us rather than against us. And that is an extraordinarily hard problem, almost a prisoner's dilemma-esque issue. And people are talking about like, hey, we should just have a regulatory agent. I would point out for people from the first detonation of a nuclear warhead to the IAEA being formed is almost 11 years, I believe. We do not have 11 years to figure this out. Yeah. And we also have to know like I, the number of people I talk to who are suffering from medical issues or other things where there may be a potential for a new drug compound to come to market to help them, they're all in. They 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 have no recourse. Yeah, there's and and there's incredible potential. First, just to to highlight the the point that you started with about what we maybe got wrong. It's it's interesting to know what it makes makes at least me think about what are we currently getting wrong that we've in the history of AI we've made at many points just very like like flipped misestimations of what AI would be good or bad at. Right. So I'll box the details, but there's this this um. Yeah, back in the 80s, there was like a, a summer internship project assigned for computer vision to someone who was at like an AI summer camp. Um, I forget the, the person's name. They ended up becoming a, a prominent computer vision researcher. But we thought that, you know, the things that are hard for humans, like logistics planning and, you know, complex math and playing, you know, chess was going to be, you know, grand challenge for AI. We thought the things that were easy to us, like seeing and perceiving the world, were going to be literally a summer project. Now that is an entire field that we're still trying to get to get right. So again, it seems like we did it here. We think, okay, well, the things that are that we pay the most for, that we think are the hardest, everything from coding to being a lawyer, maybe I, I won't prognosticate there, but those are going to be hardest for AI as well. And we're again seeing some of this get get flipped, right? That yeah. that um. You know, so it's it's interesting, and it makes you think about what are we still, um, you know, our kind blind of spots. We have unbelievable blind spots right now, okay. and and part of the thing that I see there is we were racing forward, but we are also one of my biggest learnings from serving in government this time around is that you need a very holistic team. Who is bringing this? Like, you know, right outside yeah. the Oval office, there was a stand up meeting run by the chief of staff every morning where they kind of went around the table, see what's going on, talk about specific things. And you look around that, that room and you'd be like, whoa, 
this looks like what I would want the room to look like. It's like, every, it, it looks like America, it's just like everything. And the number of times where I was working on an issue and then I, somebody would be like, have you thought about, and I'd be like, I don't even know what that means. Can you help me understand that? And they'd help me and I'd be like, oh, wow, this problem is much richer than I believe. It's kind of, I'm looking at this in orbit representation versus 3264 and so on. You, you, we have to get there given the complexity of the problems and the solutions that are required to actually have a material impact on society. Yeah, it's it's an awesome point. I mean, I'm, I'm veering off the tangent here for a second, but there's a theory of why some of the greatest innovators have actually made their biggest achievements in a new field different than what they started in. Why cross-functional groups often are, are achieving such great things? Well, the basic thing is just that when people go from one field to another, they ask a much they ask much more basic questions that when you're just in one field, very narrow, you feel like you've skipped over. But then when someone asks it, like the Obama anecdote, maybe you're like, wait, actually, we don't know the answer and we got to dig more. But you don't, you often don't see those questions asked when you're just deep in one area or one community. So that's plus one of the power of kind of um, these interdisciplinary groups. Going back to one thing that I did want to dig into, we are under investing and to move faster, right? How, how would you see that? And, and I think this gets into you know, some of the interesting debates that are happening right now that are about potential regulation, but I think they pertain to just how to move faster in general. Like, is it one big central thing, you know, company controlled or is it open? Is it distributed uh, into lots of specialist AI and data science efforts, or is it a single mega model or single mega institution? I know it's a huge question, but how do you think we, we should proceed at moving faster? So the first thing I think that which we should acknowledge is one of the most exciting things is I think of this in terms of calories, like your body has only so many calories. So if you were to run, you could only go so far based on the calories that are in your system, like that's it. And so like you could think of it as, well, if you have a relay team, you get more distance because you have more calories to burn net. If you think of the net under calories that are literally going into working on AI right now, it's insane, yeah. right? Like, we've, like we have never seen something like this. Even during web 2.0, or the you know the sorry the first web before the dot com bus, uh, there was nothing like this. This level of, of amount of people, ever everything. So the amount of calories are going in is astonishing. What we haven't done effectively is point it at key problems, and how to bring community together. So one of the things that I would really like to see is here are the five or six big problems where we could get aligned around to go after things and build out the scaffolding all the pieces. Four that I've put together in my, my massive multi-interdisciplinary problem area that I am focused on, and especially I'm doing this through a combination of policy work, but 99% of it is through company building effort, is how does AI intersect with national security? Mm -hmm. Like what does that look like overall? And people forget, that those of us that kind of grew up in the uh, 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 during the 9-11 era, that was a signal and noise problem. That is a data science problem yep. by yep. definition. That's, that's where many of us who were in Silicon Valley at that point came from. We came out of the national security apparatus. That's where our research was out of. The second portion of it is uh, the, this AI intersected, data science intersected with life sciences. How are we actually fundamentally understanding biology and how does that impact treatments, design, all the things that you could think of? We have so much opportunity and we still are dealing with cancer. And let's not forget about diseases where we need to respond much more quickly like COVID and pandemics. And then you can add to that climate. You could add to that food scarcity. You, you could go around in these things and ask, what is that going to look like? And the problem having that, like problem centric formula, like problem centric yeah. funding, problem centric anchoring and formulation. Yeah, that's right. Slam our institutions together to go after these things. Like in some way, you want to say if humanity did depended on it, wouldn't it be a better idea to slam Merck and Google together 
if like, if it was truly like an existential event, you'd be like, slam those two companies together. That's okay. We need them to work. I, I'm just picking on those two. But that is what we saw happen during COVID. You had Apple and Google working together on, on apps to figure out how to make sure your exposure notifications were there. You had people working to figure out how to get people to the right testing facilities. And then you had the all this infrastructure starting to come together. The whole COVID tracking project was all volunteer data scientists. Data scientists, AIP, whatever we want to call ourselves, we are a form of new first responder. We have remote sensing, we have the ability, we can pull things together and we can help make the people who are on the ground a bazillion time more effective. So I, it, it, I mean, it echoes back to where some of what you were saying at the beginning of interdisciplinary as critical, problem centric formulation as critical. The kind of one other hot button question here is if we set up the funding, the structure, but just the orientation in this interdisciplinary kind of problem anchored way, do you think that the right way to go at it is through a smaller number of centralized players that you know are regulated at top down, or do you think it's on the other extreme more through how a lot of data science has flourished through open source and many players with unfettered access? Because that's a lot of the debate right now about responsibility: is do we get that through you know openness, or do we get it through being more closed in a sense? Yeah. I don't know if you have thoughts there. Absolutely. So first, I think we need to recognize that policy, and when you bring stuff in at the federal government level, it is never a scalpel. It's a two by four. And so when you have something that's very nascent and it's early, you really don't want to use a two by four. <laughs> you, you want to be really careful. So the better policy style is to create guardrails as you're evolving with it. Because Take, for example, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, GINA. If you read that, you'd be like, when did the people write this? And why hasn't it been updated? HIPAA is super confusing, which kind of is HIPAA is there to protect your, your healthcare yeah. private data. That these laws don't get updated. And so once you, you do something, you shouldn't expect a law to get updated for 30 plus years. And so that has real material ramifications for society. Same downside. And so what I think we need to do is we need to be watching really carefully and asking ourselves what kind of world we want to live in. How does that actually come together? It honestly comes together because you have really good people talking a lot and sharing what works and what we think about and then asking ourselves, well, how do we ensure the technology? Like our North Star should be, how do we ensure this technology works for us rather than against us? Some of that is going to be self-police. Some of it is probably going to have to come with regulations and because people are going to do bad things. There's a reason we trust when we take a Tylenol, I'm not like, I wonder if this is counterfeit or if I have to take, you know, if anybody out there has to take, unfortunately, a chemo uh, drug. You never question, was that legit or did I actually get yeah. it? because our process is good. So maybe what we need is certain categories of AI systems need to be held to different standards than other things. That's okay. But the biggest one, if I was working where I was, I was kind of leading or driving these efforts, I would be saying, how do I get lots of thinking going on? Just like we have lots of calories going into playing, we need more people thinking, espousing, workshopping ideas, and asking ourselves, how do we actually solve these problems as a we, rather than a few people with their one political perspective or one ideolo uh, ideological perspective? This needs to be a community-driven thing. And then, and that community is not just tech people. This, this has to be those that are impacted. They have to be at the seat of the table. We oftentimes, there's one thing I've learned the most uh, is that we have to remember that data points have names. We love to talk about these things. We love to say parameters. We love to talk about this. We don't, we forget about the names and the people who are impacted. And when you get out of our nice cozy environments with cappuccinos and whatever, I'm being obviously flippant, but we get out into the world and see people, that's different. And like, I'll tell you, I spent a lot of time in healthcare. We have a healthcare company we've built, Devoted Health. 
where our mission is to take care of people who are very sick, very and have uh, and we want to take care of them like they were our own loved ones. A lot of those people, people are like, hey, give them a wearable, give them something fancy. You know what they need? They need air conditioners because they live in environments where the humidity inside there is causing mold. They need an exterminator. They need food. They need to address loneliness issues. And so if we go back to Maslow's hierarchy of food, clothing, water, shelter, and move up from there, that's a good way to approach this. And, and then what I would encourage anybody who wants to work on these problems, don't be shy about getting out of your comfort zone and into the environment to get that context. And then take all your skills and run at it hard with all this technology, because then you're going to make amazing progress. I think it comes back to, I, I'm sounding like a broken record now, but it's because it hits on something that I believe so firmly that, you know, problem anchoring versus tool set anchoring, right? If you are anchored on the problem, you're more likely to go and actually just check out their conditions and say, hey, is tool X or Y or Z even needed or what comes first? Rather than just saying, I'm a this person, I work on this type of technique, so let me throw it at the problem without putting real details and awareness against it. Um one last question. You, you were instrumental in Obama's executive order making U.S. data more open. And I know there was a whole bunch of, of data sets that got open. You touched on this a, a little bit a little while ago. Um, going one click deeper, a, a lot of the focus of what folks here in this community are working on is, you know, how their engineering of the data and data access is make or break for AI, even more so than some of the fancy, you know, downstream things that we like to teach in data science about tweaking models and algorithms. That's the kind of point of this data-centric idea. From that experience or from others as well, what are what are some of the lessons you learned about not just getting data or opening up data, but actually making it usable for data science and machine learning techniques and, and seeing success from that? What's what's critical to get right with the data? Right. To make well, the rest of the downstream stuff work well. Yeah. Uh, thanks for bringing this up. So first I got to get like, you know, that the credit of that executive order goes to an enormous amount of people. But if there are two people, I would say the most influential would be not only President Obama for giving Lane for that to be able to become a thing, but also Dennis McDonough, who is chief of staff to kind of saying, go, 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 make this happen. He's currently secretary of the VA. The part that, why, why do that? It's because what the purpose is, first, it's not the federal government's data. It's your data. The, the data that the government has is your data. It is our data. And if it's hidden behind a wall, that breaks the promise of that data. Now, it should be opened in a responsible way and make sure it's got the right all the right controls and everything else. But fundamentally, we should put that data out there so people can build on it. My, personally, my career started really using open source data from meteorological systems from the National Weather Service. And that's what led me down this path to build all this tooling and technology to make data work and so I could improve weather forecasts. That, that was my jam initially. So my belief is that we should be massively supporting figuring out how do we open up more data? How do we collect data that is going to be helpful, that gives us clarity in things. The fact that we still are not really allowed to collect data about officer-involved shootings or data around firearms or other things where we go, isn't that a serious problem in our society? That, that's crazy to me. And so what by opening up data and being able to share, like, by the way, this is how much an MRI costs here versus here. And we go, is that okay? That's like, and then somebody being able to use that data and say, well, let me help get you to the best place because I sure as heck can pull up a dozen ways to figure out where the cheapest flight is, but I can't figure out like where to get the right healthcare. Like we need, that's where entrepreneurship happens and government can play its part by opening up data, providing that seed capital that creates a spark in the energy but then it's the rest of our job to come in with other capital, other energy sources, other things to make this actually work and break out in society. That's the contract. That is the social contract of innovation that we should have as a society. 
That's awesome. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for taking the time today. This was was awesome to to get to chat with you, and and um, I really appreciate you making the time for this.